In order to keep it simple, I will not use the Lorentz equations directly, but start with a few concepts that might be familiar to people who know a little bit about relativity, namely time dilation and space contraction. For those unfamiliar with these phenomena, I recommend the Einstein light link. Time dilation is the phenomena that if we measure a time interval at rest in one system, then that time interval will appear to be longer for an observer in another system. Also the distance, as defined as the difference in position of two ends of a road that rest at a given time in one system, will appear to be smaller when observed by someone in another inertial system. The transformation rules are shown here, and the scaling factor is square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if the relative velocity is 86.6% of the speed of light, you will have a length contraction and time dilation of a factor of 2. Of course, for the guy in the spaceship, the meter stick will be one meter long, and his clock will update itself one second per second. Also, if the spaceman looks out the window, he will observe the observer in the same manner as the observer sees him. Velocity is also transformed differently here than in Galilean systems. For smaller relative velocities, you get that w is almost equal to v plus w marked. But for high velocities, you will not get above the speed of light as long as none of the components v and w marked are superluminal already. So the prospect for going through the absolute speed barrier is dim. Next is the transformation of acceleration. The proper way to do this is by double differentiating the Lorentz equations and assuming that acceleration starts at rest in one of the systems. I'll avoid calculus as long as possible though. Instead I'll use length contraction and time dilation and use that acceleration is the difference in the difference of position divided by time difference squared. And I get the following formula. A equals to A mark times 1 minus V squared over C squared in the power of 3 over 2. Again, this is not the proper way to do this, but the results are okay. Acceleration is no longer a quantity shared by all inertial systems, and thus one might need to specify the system. If a constant acceleration relative to the observer should be maintained, then acceleration in the spaceship needs to be increased when the relative velocity is increased. So, if I want an acceleration of 1g for the Earthling, and the spaceship moves with a velocity of 86.6% of c, the spaceship will need to provide an acceleration of 8 g's. Sooner or later, Scotty will shout out, I'm giving her all she got, Captain, but she can't take no more! Or the spaceship will be flattened by the enormous acceleration provided by the rockets. However, that's not what's meant by an uniformly accelerating system. Rather, it is the acceleration measured by a system at rest relative to the accelerating movement that needs to be constant. So again, if the spaceship moves at 86.6% of the speed of light and sees an accelerating movement of 1g, then the Earthling observer will see an acceleration of 1 eighth of a g. Next thing up is not only to let the spaceship see an accelerating movement aboard the ship, but actually let the ship itself be accelerating. The spaceship will then no longer be an inertial system, but we can construct an inertial system for each state of the spaceship, and thus still be able to use special relativity. The explanation behind the velocity of the ship relative to the observer is now the acceleration. So now I'm saying that the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity and put that back into the equation for transforming acceleration. This is called a differential equation and cannot be solved without a little calculus, integration to be precise. The result of that calculus is that v over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared equals to gt. 
assuming that the spaceship starts accelerating at t equals to zero. This equation can be inverted so that we can find velocity as a function of observer time t. What we get is that v of t is equal to gt over square root of 1 plus gt over c squared. And this expression can no longer get larger than c. For any finite time, the velocity will be smaller. I suppose that's good news for the flat earthers, but so be it. If the acceleration is 10 meters per second square, then the velocity will be 71.8% of the speed of light after one observer year, 99.5% after 10 years, and 99.995% after 100 years. Next, we can find the position of the spaceship relative to the observer as a function of observer time. Again, we need calculus. We need to find the opposite of a derivative, which is called an integral. The time integral of a velocity yields the position. This result looks quite different from the Newtonian result, but for small time intervals it's actually approximately the same. For large time intervals the position changes with c meters per second, which means that the spaceship is approximately moving at the speed of light. There is also a constant term which will appear if I draw a space-time diagram. Before that, I'll note that so far I have described the accelerating system from an outside inertial observer. Now it's time to take a peek into the strange world of the accelerated system. In order to do this, note that now we want to describe the whole universe from the accelerated system, not just the spaceship. So that we have height, two other spatial orientations and time in an accelerated frame. 